Blitzkrieg in the Past is a science fiction short story that was published in a July 1942 edition of Amazing Stories, an American magazine dedicated to featuring sci-fi adventure stories written by several different figures in the industry. Blitzkrieg in the Past is about a trio of military men that are sent back in time in their M3 tank, finding themselves millions of years into the past where they encounter and fight against new prehistoric enemies. It's a fun and goofy little story written by a man named John York Cabot, who was really David Wright O'Brien. The Cabot name was just one of many pseudonyms for O'Brien, a serious but also whimsical young writer who would write his first story called Truth is a Plague in 1940. At the time, he was in his early 20s, and in the short span of a few years, he would write some 40 or 50 different short stories for science fiction and pulp outlets like Amazing Stories and Fantastic adventures magazines. O'Brien was a man that really liked eccentric stories, one with humor and adventure, and he would create these stories under various different names like Bruce Dennis, Richard Varden, Alexander Blade, Clee Garson, and Duncan Farnsworth. Fun fact about that last one, O'Brien's uncle was named Farnsworth Wright, who was actually a famous editor for the pulp fiction magazine Weird Tales. It's almost like he picked that name to honor his uncle, who at the time had already passed away. As far as O'Brien's life goes, it's kind of hard to tell exactly how it was. Despite his apparent serious-minded manner, at least according to the editor's note in the November 1940 issue of Amazing Stories that features him in their Meet the author spotlight segment of the magazine, the way he describes his childhood and upbringing in this same issue feels almost unbelievable. According to O'Brien, he was born on the back of a racing camel in the middle of the Gobi Desert and started working at the age of four as a paper boy. He fell in love at age six, considered himself a failure at age seven, despite apparently holding what he describes as the rough and tumble catch as catch can championship of Middle Arabia, which might sound confusing, but apparently that's referencing an old style of wrestling that had less restrictions on moves. Anyways, he joins a monastery to become a monk, I guess, resigns from it, and at age 10, yes, 10, he goes to the United States and survived on crumbs that he was able to scrape out of the bottoms of New York's automats. Diego, what the fuck does this have to do with dinosaurs, you might be reasonably asking? Nothing, but this is just too weird to not include in the video. Anyways, a few years later, he's in Chicago, trying to get an education from Loyola Academy. He spent the next four years learning football, got a job as a police reporter, also also dug ditches at one point, left the college after talking to the dean that apparently hated his guts, pumped out a bunch of science fiction short stories, acquired a whole lot of debt, to the point where he apparently formed his own little game called Dodge the Creditor. And he ends the segment saying, I have childlike faith in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and in my ability to say slipshod after seven drinks. I don't know what I read, but I think I'm in love with this man. I think what's hilarious about this whole segment is the editor's note that follows right after it. Because of this jokey and satirical description, the editor felt the need to clarify that Mr. O'Brien over here had adopted a rather facetious tone to this bit about himself. It continues by saying that despite this, he is a serious-minded young man who's got a lot of potential when it comes to storytelling. And I could be wrong, but I think it even teases Blitzkrieg in the past. We have on hand three more yarns by O'Brien, excluding the story presented in this issue. Coming soon is a time travel story with a new twist. Again, I could be wrong, maybe O'Brien created more than one time traveling story that was released sooner than Blitzkrieg in the past. Regardless, a little over a year and a half later, Blitzkrieg in the past would release in the July 1942 issue of Amazing Stories. So without further ado, let's take a look at this dinosaur short story. The story takes place in modern-day Georgia, where we meet our trio of military men a part of the U.S. Tank Corps. Our main character, whose perspective we follow throughout the story, is Burt Joyce. And he's damn proud of his military position, considering it to be the backbone of the U.S. Army. It gets to the point where even he admits that he might be a bit cocky, but is still confident that his branch is the superior one than the others. He's teamed up with his two friends in the force to operate a light tank together, an M3 to be more specific. 
There's Rusty Harrigan, who's dim-witted, but strong and good-natured and typically takes the position of the gunner in the tank. And leads McAndrews, who's smart, level-headed, and good at figuring out anything, it seems. There's nothing he doesn't know that he can't learn if you give him five minutes to concentrate, as the story describes. He's usually in the tower guiding Bert, the driver of the tank, into whatever direction they need to go in. As I mentioned earlier, O'Brien liked stories that were eccentric, and as a result, his own stories seemed to have a certain zaniness to them that made them an entertaining and fun read. To me, the humor of this particular story comes from the banter between these three friends. They're distinguishable from each other, but their differences offer funny exchanges to one another, and they just bounce off each other pretty well. Going back to the story, Bert's friends meet him at his barracks where they tell him they're scheduled to test some new equipment out with their M3 that afternoon. They're not too happy about that though, considering they were scheduled for time off that afternoon, but they conclude that the reason why their tank out of everyone else's was picked was because they were the best of the bunch. Of course, that doesn't really make them any happier. Anyways, later that day they meet with their commanding officer to go over the plans for their upcoming test, which is simply described as a routine tank reconnaissance operations over terrain that their commanding officer had mapped out for them to follow. The reason they're doing this is to test a device that's being installed into their tank as they speak. It's not completely specified what this device is or how it operates as it's classified information. The most their commanding officer tells them is that the device and this test will be a rather startling development in tank radio communication if it works. But overall, their order is to follow the selected path and not worry about the device. You know what? Seems simple enough. Very straightforward. Surely things will go completely as planned. Things don't go completely as planned. With their orders, the trio make their way to the garrison grounds to operate their M3, which is already fitted with the newly installed radio-like device that Leeds is especially fascinated with. On the grounds, their commanding officer, along with other military higher-ups, are waiting for them. Next to them, a short, bald-headed man also waits, who they assume to be the inventor of the device who was working with the military to have it tested. They're given the signal to move and begin their trajectory in the hot Georgia afternoon, until it eventually starts raining almost out of nowhere. The rain gets pretty heavy, much to the dismay of Rusty, who's tasked with being up in the tower, a trade-off that he made with Leeds so that Leeds can inspect the device instead. This is one of the funny conversations I was mentioning earlier. Rusty initially wanted to be up in the tower to get some fresh air for a change, cause you know, we could all agree that working inside a tank in triple digit degree weather is probably not the most comfortable thing, so he was all for letting Leeds be inside the tank to mess around with the radio device. However, the moment Rusty he hears that it might rain, he says something to Leeds along the lines of, Hell no, the minute it starts raining, we're switching spots. But Leeds is like, You didn't say shit when I first made the offer. And Rusty admits the offer sounded better at first, to which Leeds calls him out on his bullshit, saying something along the lines of, So basically, you agree to do something at the start of the deal, but the minute it doesn't go your way, you try to back out of it. And before Rusty can even answer, he finishes off saying, Unforeseen circumstances can't make an agreement any less binding ethically. And from there, Rusty just gives up because he knows he can't win an argument with someone like Leeds. I know I'm spending a lot of time on this, but again, I just really like the back and forth conversations these guys have. It just gives off a sense of relatability in this very weird science fiction short story. Anyways, things get pretty serious for the team. The downpour doesn't slow, in fact, it gets stronger and soon an electrical storm occurs. They do their best to maneuver their M3 across the muddy fields before a thunderbolt strikes directly at their tank causing a massive white explosion and literally sending their tank into the air. The sudden jolts of the tank cause Bert to hit his head, Leeds to fall over, and Rusty to hang on for dear life in the tower before everything eventually goes black for the team. When Bert awakes in the tank from being knocked out, he discovers they're in a completely different location, or so it would seem. What used to be the fields of Georgia was now a clearing with a surrounding jungle filled with all kinds of noises and sounds caused by unknown animals. 
Despite the hit it took, the tank was in okay condition and the radio device installed within it was completely undamaged. They explore their new surroundings, trying to make sense of their situation. In doing this, they do make a few small observations. You know, the storm has subsided. There's a strange footprint nearby that looks like it could have come from a dinosaur. Oh yeah, and of course, there's a nine-legged frog monster that appears almost out of nowhere. Luckily, Rusty wastes no time and shoots the dangerous looking animal in the eye with his pistol. As you'd expect, they'd never seen anything like it before and are shocked at the sight of it. During this whole time, Bert tries to look for a solid explanation for their situation but is unable to. Rusty suggests that maybe they died and they're in some kind of afterlife. And Leeds slowly makes the realization that they may have traveled back in time somehow and are still in Georgia just millions of years in the past. Of course, Bert is very skeptical, but again, he's unable to come up with another explanation. Regardless, they're forced to camp there for the night. They take turns keeping watch while the others sleep in the tank, with Bert taking the first shift. When his time is up during the middle of the night, he wakes up Rusty for his shift. He dozes off in a tank and is suddenly awakened by a strange, hairy figure. It was a Neanderthal, two of them. They pull Bert out of the tank, bind him in a rope material, and throw him next to Rusty, who had been knocked out and already bound. He notices that Leeds is nowhere to be seen, but before he can do anything about it, he's knocked unconscious by the Neanderthals as well. When he wakes up, he finds himself near a fire outside a large cave entrance. Inside the cave is a large community of Neanderthals, and on both sides of the entrance, crudely constructed ladders lead to smaller cave systems, which possibly serve as homes for individual or smaller groups of Neanderthals. The entire thing was on a mountainside, presumably for the community's protection from some of the other prehistoric creatures that roamed during this point in time. Soon, he's grabbed by one of the Neanderthals and is carried deep into the large cave before being dropped onto the ground. He's pressured to get up and when he does, he hears a familiar voice, the voice of Rusty, who was completely free and even a bit excited despite being surrounded by the Neanderthal tribe that attacked them. But they all seem to be rather mild compared to how they were during their first encounter with them. Rusty then explains to Bert what had happened. When it was his turn to guard the camp, back at the M3, he couldn't help but venture a little bit into the woods, seemingly out of curiosity, before the Neanderthals got the jump on him from the trees. Bert's not too happy with Rusty's borderline ADHD almost getting them killed, and this is where we get some more funny chatter between the two friends. Rusty's like, listen Bert, there were like a dozen of them that attacked the camp. Bert says, that's bullshit Rusty, there were literally only two of them. Hey, who's counting? For all we know, there could have been 30. There were two of them, dipshit. Okay, I may be a bit colorful with the dialogue here, but you get the gist of the conversation. It was pretty funny. Rusty continues by saying it was all worth it though, because the leader of these Neanderthals is a queen, a very beautiful woman who's far more advanced than them. Rusty was spared from his bindings as requested from the queen, which could mean she wants something from him. But of course, with Rusty being Rusty, to him, that obviously means the queen is in love with him or something. But now this begged the question, where the hell was Leeds? Bert doesn't remember if he was in the tank or not when he was taken out of it and didn't see him being taken away by the Neanderthals, nor did Rusty have any idea what happened to him. They noticed that at the end of the cave was a scuff and primitively built throne, and behind it was a smaller cave entrance, where the queen eventually emerged from. And Bert is completely enamored with the sight of her. My jaw must have been fully an inch slack, my eyes ready to be knocked off by sticks, he says. She is described as slender, having ripe red lips, high cheekbones, luminously commanding eyes, and she communicated through purrs. Yeah, that sounds weird, but yeah, she, she communicates by purring, apparently. As beautiful as this woman is described, if I learned anything from these stories, the most beautiful ones are often the most psychotic. But in the moment, our main characters didn't seem to care. Like, Bert and Rusty were hardcore thirsty for her. I'm not even joking. I mean, at least at first they were. Eventually, Bert comes to his senses, especially after the queen sends for one of the Neanderthals from the cave corridor that stands by her throne. When he arrives, Bert and Rusty are surprised to see him carry Tommy guns received from their tank. She orders Bert and Rusty to grab the guns where she clearly wants them to demonstrate to her how they work by making hand gestures that are similar to pulling a trigger, indicating that she may have already seen them in action, possibly when Rusty shot the nine-legged animal from earlier. Rusty fires the gun at the wall, which is enough for the queen to move things along. 
She then has more of her Neanderthal henchmen bring in two tied up people with sacks over their heads. One is revealed to be Leeds, and the other is revealed to be a caveman of some kind, one who's just as advanced as the Queen. It becomes clear to Bert what the Queen wants them to do. She wants Bert and Rusty to execute these prisoners with their Tommy guns. Now, this may sound pretty stupid. Why would you give people you knocked out weapons of mass destruction, especially if you know to some extent how they worked prior to their demonstration? And why would you continue to trust them after they showed you what the weapons are capable of? While it's understandable the Neanderthals may not completely get it, it's weird the Queen doesn't foresee what could probably happen as a result of this decision. However, Bert makes it clear that even if they wanted to escape the cave guns a-blazing, they couldn't on the account of not having enough ammunition to do so. But Bert has a plan. He goes up to Leeds, who is still unconscious, and tries to slap him awake, but does it in a way where it looks like he wants to try to wake up his prisoner so that he's conscious when he kills him. When Leeds eventually wakes up from the slaps, Bert quickly fills him in on everything while speaking in an aggressive tone to make it seem like he detests Leeds. Luckily, Leeds is a smart man and catches on to what Bert's trying to do and plays along. Rusty takes a little longer to catch on, but eventually he does the same thing to the other prisoner who wakes up and gets filled in on everything in the same way Bert did with Leeds. Despite the language barrier, the cavemen seem to understand. Then, Bert goes up to the queen and drops to one knee, and holds out the gun in a gesture that says, if anyone should get the privilege of firing the first shot, it should be you. Delighted by the gesture, the queen reaches for the gun. When all of a sudden, Bert jolts up and wraps his arm around her throat and pushes the gun to her back, holding her hostage. But this doesn't stop one Neanderthal from going after him, who is immediately gunned down by Rusty. The sight of one of their own being killed from a distance by a loud and strange weapon catches the rest of the tribe completely by surprise, and they stand in complete shock. With the main entrance blocked, the group take the queen and book it to the cave entrance behind her throne. While all of that was occurring, Leeds was talking with the caveman whose name is Yanga, and is able to loosely understand and translate what he says. Yanga helps them by carrying the queen as Bert and Rusty hold off the Neanderthals, who seem smart enough to stay behind to not get shot. Oh yeah, almost forgot. Before they made their grand escape, Leeds had filled them in very briefly on what had happened to him. Apparently, he somehow got away from the Neanderthals during their first encounter and tried to go after them to rescue Rusty and Bert. As he did this, he stumbled upon the tribe the Queen was formerly a part of. Apparently, she is considered to be a renegade of that tribe as she wanted to lead the Neanderthals in an attempt to start her own blood rule. Yanga was one of the ones that threw her out of the tribe and was caught along with Leeds by the Neanderthals to be taken back to the Queen to face their punishment. Okay, now that we're all caught up with that, now they have to figure out what to do with this psycho queen. They literally decide to just ditch her behind a rock and just have Yanga and his group come back for her later to decide their own justice for her crimes. While they do that, they notice Yanga's people advancing towards the cave system to start a battle with the Neanderthals. Leeds suggests they establish their dominance in this world by tracking down their M3 and showing the Neanderthals what happens when you follow orders to survive. In all seriousness, Leeds logic is that if they're going to be stuck in the past, they should show the other tribes not to mess with them to increase their own chances of survival. So they go find their tank, bringing Yanga with them and have him ride in the tower to guide them through the prehistoric terrain. Despite never having done something like this before, Yanga learned fast in directing them. They show back up to the caves with their tank finding Yanga's tribe in battle with the Neanderthals, throwing rocks at them from a distance. But the team in the tank find a more efficient way to take care of their enemies. They notice a large overhanging rock structure over the Neanderthal community. Leeds suggest they bury the community by shooting at the overhang and causing it to crash right on top of them. They get closer, position their tank, and fire the first shot. Direct hit, but it doesn't quite do the trick. Another shot is fired, which is enough to break the structure apart, causing it to do exactly what they wanted it to, to tumble on top of the Neanderthal's cave community. As a storm breaks out, Yanga leaves to go join the rest of his tribe. Leeds then realizes that the storm could be their ticket home. Some interference with the lightning bolt and the radio device installed in their tank caused them to travel back in time. Maybe doing the same thing will reverse the effects, and if there was a time to test this, it was now. 
The trio ride their tank over the buried community of Neanderthals to the top of the mountain to get a better clearing for a thunderbolt blast. As they attempt to do this though, they hear a deafening roar. Ahead of them stands a large theropod dinosaur, most likely a Tyrannosaurus Rex, who doesn't seem to fancy our main characters fucking up the environment with their giant metal vehicle of mass destruction. So the T-Rex tries to shut that shit down. Luckily, these guys are the best of the bunch and are able to aim the barrel of their tank at this charging dinosaur and blast it in the side. Injured but still moving, the T-Rex tries to get back up. But our heroes, quote unquote, are like, whoa, an innocent animal is trying to defend itself? That's cringe. So they reload and fire again, this time taking the animal down for good. I kind of feel bad for the T-Rex, I'm not gonna lie. Anyways, they continue their way as the storm gets stronger and stronger. Before they know it, their tank is hit with another bolt of lightning, making everything go dark again. When they wake up, they find their tank had landed on its side. They crawl out and no longer see dense jungles or hear terrifying primordial sounds. Instead, they hear the pattering of rain and see nothing but open present-day Georgia fields. Rusty then apologizes to Bert and Leeds for falling asleep on the job. Of course, they're confused by this, as they were both fully aware of the events they had just went through. But they eventually realize that Rusty had legitimately thought he had dreamt the entire thing up and that him sleeping on the job somehow led to the tank landing on its side. Before Bert and Leeds try to correct him, they seem to mentally agree that it's best for Rusty to think it was a dream, as surely no one would believe their story anyways and they would look crazy if they tried spilling about it. So they decide to play along with the dream story, and are somehow gonna have to find an excuse for why this piece of uh, army equipment is on its side and damaged, but you know, we don't we don't worry about that. The short ends with Burt and Leeds just being glad they're home in the present day. This was a really fun story, but honestly, it could have used more dinosaurs. I think that's my only real criticism for the story. I think it would have been better had there been more dinosaur interactions within it. But to be fair, that probably wasn't entirely the point. I don't know, when I hear the concept of traveling into the past to prehistoric times, I kind of expect to see some dinosaurs. But O'Brien continued writing even after enlisting in the army himself. So maybe the point of this story was to focus more on the military aspect of it, so that he could, in a way, jot down his own experiences in the Force through his science fiction stories. Regardless of the intentions, it's written really well. All of the characters are fun to follow, their interactions are just really funny to me for some reason, I don't know why. There's never really a dull moment when you're reading this. Sure, it's nothing too deep, but it's a science fiction short story, so it's not really supposed to be. If you're someone that likes fun writing and a lot of action, this is a pretty good story for you. If you're someone who's only here for the dinosaurs, I'd say this one is skippable. I kid you not, the one actual dinosaur featured in this story doesn't even show up until the last few pages. And when it does, it's killed off pretty quickly. And speaking of featured animals within the story, it's not at all explained what the nine-legged monster was. It's described as some kind of toad or frog monster, something that I guess existed during prehistoric times in this universe. The drawing of it is pretty cool, but I don't really get the point of it. I don't know if it's supposed to represent anything, maybe it references another work, or maybe one of O'Brien's previous stories? Or maybe I'm overthinking it and it was simply included to add more to the crazy, pulpy science fiction element. Again, I don't know, but this is a pretty neat little story overall. As far as O'Brien goes, his life would be tragically cut short at the very young age of 26. Like I said earlier, O'Brien had enlisted in the Army, more specifically the US Army Air Force during World War II, and was killed in combat as his plane was shot down during a bombing raid in Berlin. But again, despite his young age, he left behind several science fiction short stories for us to remember him by. 